Oh, because I thought they were going to get a new projector. They're getting a new video recorder instead. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce Roger Howe. Um, uh, Roger Howe, he attained his Ph.D. from Berkeley in 1969. And in 1974, before the age of 30, was appointed full professor at Yale University, where he is currently the William R. Kennan, Jr. Professor of Mathematics. Uh, he is a member of both the... USA National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Science. Uh, his research has been in the field of group theory, uh, group and representation theory. He has made fundamental and decisive contributions in the area of periodic groups, uh, reductive dual pairs, and, and, and consequently automorphic forms in number theory, and most recently invariant theory. He has had a continuous stream of students at Yale who themselves have gone on to illustrious careers at such places our own uh, HKUST. Uh, the former head of the math department is Roger Student, uh, NUS, uh, MIT, and many other schools in both the USA and Asia. Uh, besides being an eminent researcher, he has taken the time to show great service to the academic community and by way of, uh, by way of editorships, external advisors, and education reform. Uh, we are delighted today to have him here in Hong Kong as a visiting member of HKUST IAS. And today's talk is New Paradigms in Invariant Theory. Okay, now everybody can hear, yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much for that gracious introduction. Um, I'd like to uh, talk about uh, invariant theory from kind of a historical perspective today. And um, uh, I don't know if there are any physicists in the, in the room, but uh, um, it's sort of well known that physics has served as an inspiration and a kind of a, a source of problems for mathematics over the years. It has been a very important uh, way, to, uh, a, a way to get mathematicians thinking about new issues and, and to analyze things more deeply. And uh, in some sense, uh, invariant theory has played that role with respect to algebra, so the examples and the challenges coming from invariant theory and, and, and then later representation theory have uh, provided uh, important impetus uh, for developing certain branches of abstract algebra, and I'd like to uh, sort of illustrate that today. So I'll start with something uh, very elementary. Uh, so uh, here is here's a general... Um, quadratic equation in two variables. And uh, so we might wonder what kind of curves does this, if we set this equal to zero, what kind of curves will we get? And it's not transparent just from looking at that what will happen. Uh, but you can try to um, get a better handle on it by, by trying to simplify the equation, maybe by transforming the variables in some way. So uh, as a first uh, try, you could try translating the variables. So substitute for x, another variable uh, plus a constant, and similarly for y. And if you do that, what you find is that the coefficients, uh, so here are the old coefficients and here are the new coefficients, and uh, they are related to each other by a linear transformation. In this case, it's a six by six matrix, which I've written out here. And um, 
The key thing that I want to point out here is these entries down. So up here, the identity uh, in this part of the matrix shows that the coefficients A, B, and C actually don't change. But what happens is that uh, with A, B, and C, you get, uh, you get contributions to the changes in the coefficients of the linear terms, so you can change the coefficients for the linear terms. And if you study this equation, uh, you see that if uh, this quantity AC minus B squared is non-zero, then you can actually eliminate the linear terms. You can make D and E uh, equal to zero. So that's the first stage uh, that you can do. And um, so then you... Uh, so then you come down just to the equation um, ax squared plus b, 2bxy plus cy squared uh, plus some constant is equal to zero. And uh, this is still, well, this is simpler, but it's not completely simple, so we'd like to simplify it more. So now we could rotate. So we could find new variables x prime and y prime, which are gotten by uh, applying a little rotation matrix to x and y. And if we do that, again, we see that the new coefficients are gotten by multiplying the old coefficients by some matrix, which depends on the transformation. And uh, if you analyze this, uh, you, you see that if you choose uh, your angle of rotation to be a certain amount uh, specified by the coefficients, then you can get the new B prime coefficient to be equal to zero. And so then you're just reduced to, so the equation that was uh, uh, AX uh, plus 2BXY plus CY squared equals 1 would just become the equation A prime X squared plus C prime Y squared equals 1. And of course, this is something that's uh, very familiar from high school uh, mathematics, and we know that it defines either an ellipse or a hyperbola in standard position, depending on the signs of A prime and C prime. So by these uh, methods of, of changing coordinates, you can reduce a complicated equation to a much simpler one, which you can understand quite well. And this, in fact, uh, this can be found in a lot of elementary textbooks. What is not uh, usually discussed in such textbooks is an observation that was made by George Boole in 1841, which is that when you're doing these transformations and changing the coefficients around, there's some expressions in the coefficients, some combinations of the coefficients, which do not change, which are invariant, even as you make these translations and rotations. Uh, so uh, this is the first observation that some quantity, although the coefficients, each of them change individually, there's some uh, combinations of them which don't change, which are invariant. And the second observation is that these invariants really embody the geometry of the curve that you're talking about. So for example, for the example of the conic sections, uh, the... Uh, the sum of the two coefficients of x squared and y squared, a plus c, remains invariant under uh, those rotations, and also what's called the discriminant of the, uh, of the equation, a c minus b squared, um, also remains invariant. If you're used to seeing 4b squared, uh, it's only b squared because there was a 2 in the, in the way I wrote the equation. Uh, and then uh, here's, another, uh, here's another combination of those. So I, you could write it as a minus c squared plus 4b squared. And it doesn't look as if it's invariant when I write it like this. But you can rewrite it like this. is t squared minus 4 delta. So here I've expressed it in terms of these basic invariants. So this sigma squared will also be an invariant. And then it turns out that, uh, that in terms of these functions here, you can, you can describe the geometry of the curve. So for example, uh, if t is positive 
and uh, D is positive, then you'll have an ellipse. And uh, you can actually give formulas for the important uh, uh, aspects of the ellipse, the important features. The semi-major axis is this, the semi-minor axis of this, and the area is this. So you can actually take your invariance and uh, capture the geometry of the curve you're interested in, in terms of those invariants. So this observation of George Boole um, got other mathematicians uh, quite excited, uh, especially uh, Arthur Cayley in England and his friend uh, Sylvester, Joseph Sylvester, and also some uh, several mathematicians in Germany. Um, became very excited about this approach to geometry of understanding a geometric object through uh, the invariance uh, that you found when you, when you transformed it. And so uh, they, they, they took many, many examples and calculated all the invariance. And this occupied uh, a huge amount of effort uh, in the middle of the 19th century. Um, and so as they did their calculations, uh, they made some key observations. Well, of course, um, <clears throat> so the invariants can have any degree. Uh, they can be polynomials of very, very large degree. But um, <clears throat> in some sense, uh, some of those will be redundant in that sense if you, so you have these principles about invariants, that if you have two invariants and you take their sum, again, that function will be invariant. Or if you take their product, that will be invariant. So we sum the, that, uh, these facts up these days by saying that the invariants form a ring. So a ring is just an object uh, or a structure where you can add and where you can multiply. So, uh, and, and it was out of, out of uh, this kind of work that the con one, this is one place where the concept of ring sort of uh, became an important idea. So, uh, so the invariant theorists of the 19th century were interest in, interested in, in describing the rings of invariants. Uh, and so, well, one, 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 see, the, one nice thing about this is that means, so there will be invariants of arbitrarily high degree, very many, as you know, because if I just take one invariant and I raise it to a high power, I'll get another invariant. Uh, but what you can hope is that, uh, that you could find a small number of invariants of maybe not very big degree, such that if you take the all sums and products uh, that you can generate from them, then you'll get all the invariants. So um, uh, what, they, uh, what they found in examples and, um, was that uh, that these rings of, of, gen of invariants were finitely generated. So they could find a finite number of generators and then some relations between those generators so that they could describe all the invariants. However, uh, as, uh, as they worked out more and more examples, uh, the new examples got harder and harder. And uh, they, were, uh, they sur sort of used up the examples that they could compute easily, and, and they, started, um, they started getting to places where they just got too tired to do it. Um, and so they started uh, asking more theoretical questions. And uh, so they knew that in all their examples, uh, they only needed a finite number of generators, and they asked, well, will this always be true? Will it, will it always be true that we'll on, always only need a finite number of generators? And uh, so the, the, one of the people I mentioned on that slide, Paul Gordon, uh, so the main examples that people had been working out were examples of functions of two variables. So I, I showed you the quadratic uh, function, but you could consider a uh, well, first of all, they only considered homogeneous ones. So uh, only the AX, plus, AX squared plus 2XY plus CY squared 
part of, of that uh, equation. But then they considered the analog with order three terms and with order four terms. And uh, they, they computed the invariance of a lot of these things. But as I say, pretty soon it got pretty hard. And so they, they asked, well, can we, even though we can't maybe compute them explicitly, can we be sure that there are, we really always only need a finite number? Uh, so Paul Gordon worked on this problem, and he showed that for functions of two variables, it was true. You always only needed a finite number. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, people had gotten more ambitious, and they asked, well, what about more variables, three variables, four variables? And, uh, and Gordon's proof uh, was it didn't work for a larger number of variables. So um, this was a problem, and this problem was solved by David Hilbert. And uh, this was really sort of the beginning of abstract algebra, and uh, so this is the first example of, well, I mean, sort of the culmination, really, of the, of the first stimulus of invariant theory for abstract algebra. And so Hilbert proved a theorem, which is still an important theorem in commutative algebra today, called the Hilbert basis theorem, which, uh, on the faces of it, has nothing to do with invariant theory. But he used this theorem, plus some basic constructions of invariant theory to prove the finite generation theorem. Uh, and at the time, uh, the reasoning that Hilbert used in this theorem was extremely radical. And uh, in fact, Paul Gordon was the uh, referee for Hilbert's paper, and he reacted rather negatively to it. He said, this is not mathematics, this is theology. It was, that's sort of just, these days, that's, uh, we take that as an indication of the newness of the ideas that Hilbert was, uh, was introducing. And in particular, so Hilbert's proof was not constructive. He did not show how to find a collection of generators for the invariance. He just proved that there had to be a finite number. Um, Okay, so uh, so the first the first uh, chapter maybe is is uh, is how invariant theory stimulated the beginnings of abstract algebra, and uh, so this resolved this uh, Hilbert's theorem resolved the main outstanding theoretical question in invariant theory at that time, and people had gotten pretty tired and they they couldn't think of new examples that they could. Uh, compute very easily, so this kind of led to a lull in the activity of in, in invariant theory. Uh, um, at around that time, Emmy Nerther uh, was uh, growing up, and, and she became a student, actually, of Paul Gordon. And her thesis was uh, computing the invariance of a particular system. And she did it, but she found it very exhausting. So she sort of didn't like that, uh, that kind of activity, and she, she wanted to do other things. So she, she went uh, and decided that she wanted to understand the principles behind the kinds of computations she had been doing. So she devoted her attention to abstract algebra. So again, invariant theory through Hilbert and then through Emmy Nerther, uh, led to a huge stimulation of, uh, of algebra. Okay, and while this was going on, uh, I should say that uh, it became understood that represent invariant theory kind of led to representation theory. People realized that if you wanted, even if you only wanted to understand the functions that were invariant under some uh, transformations, you had to under uh, some group of transformations. You had to understand all the possible ways that those functions could possibly transform under under that group of transformations, and this led to the idea of representation theory. And uh, today, representation theory is is sort of understood as a 
as a geometric or an algebraic way or, uh, to, to, to deal with group actions. So the invariant theory and representation theory and, and group actions today are considered uh, sort of aspects of the same uh, area of investigation. And I don't know uh, how familiar people are with the representation theory, and I don't want to uh, describe it in a great deal, in a great detail. I don't have time, but I'll just say this about it. That, um, so the idea, representation theory, one way to think about it is you can think of it as non-commutative spectral theory. So spectral theory is about finding the eigenvalues of a single operator and the eigenvectors of a single operator, sort of trying to take a single operator and find uh, coordinates in which it looks as simple as possible. Again, you have this idea of changing coordinates to make something look simple. And so uh, spectral theory sort of tells us how to change coordinates to make an operator look simple, almost diagonal or almost diagonal. Uh, and, but with, with non-commutative systems of operators, you cannot always find just single vectors which are uh, invariant or invariant up to a scalar under, under the operators. And you have to use larger dimensional spaces. And sort of the smallest possible spaces which can be invariant under uh, a, a group of operators is called an irreducible representation. So there's this little dictionary uh, that you can think of that representation theory is a non-commutative version of spectral theory and that irreducible representations replace eigenvalues as, as the object of interest. Okay, so um, what I want to then tell you about is, is uh, some rings that are important in representation theory. Uh, and they come in, they're, they're sort of two types, uh, and I'm not going to be able to describe them in general, but I'll just give them names. Uh, there's the, the flag algebras, and I'll describe an example of a flag algebra uh, in, in a minute. And then uh, uh, there are branching algebras. And uh, I, I'll just remark that sort of the key construction in representation theory of, of groups like the general linear group and related groups is what's called highest weight theory. And both of these things are constructed using highest weight theory. And highest weight theory is actually a key example of the connection between representation theory and invariant theory. But I can't explain that either, I'm afraid. Okay. Um, so let me, let me just uh, give you the basic example of, uh, of a flag algebra. So this is for the general linear group. A, a similar example works for any uh, group like the general linear group. So uh, what this is, the flag algebra, is it's a ring of functions on a coset space. So you take the general linear group and you take the subgroup of matrices which are upper triangular with ones along the diagonal. So these are called upper unipotent matrices. So you can show that these are closed under multiplication, so they form a group. And you look at the coset space of that group and all the regular functions on that space. And it turns out that from a representation theory point of view, uh, this is exactly what you want to look at. This is, um, uh, so the highest weight theory tells you that this, uh, this ring of functions uh, contains one copy. So remember, the key things that you want to find are the irreducible representations. Turns out that this ring of functions contains one copy of each irreducible representation of the group, which in this case is the general linear group. Um, and in a very beautiful way. Namely, so you have this group, and this is the group of upper triangular uh, unipotent matrices, and uh, you have also the diagonal matrices, and the diagonal matrices operate on, uh, on the 
so the, this group is acting on the right, and the group G is acting on the left here. And you can also let the, the diagonal matrices act on the right uh, because it normalizes this group U. And then you can break up this space into eigenvectors for that diagonal, the diagonal matrices. And if you do that, these irreducible representations are also exactly the eigenspaces for the diagonal subgroups. So this is an extremely lovely structure which sort of captures all, uh, it sort of gives you a snapshot of the representation theory of GLN or a similar kind of a group. So you'd really like to understand that ring. And uh, so this, uh, the challenge of understanding this ring in the case of GLN was undertaken by uh, William Hodge uh, around 1940. And uh, so I should say that it was, yeah. Um, so I, I mentioned that uh, the, the paradigm that had come out of, of, of the classical period in representation theory was that you wanted to understand a ring in terms of generators and relations. And this has been pretty much the standard paradigm up until now. Uh, but Hodge's calculations sort of uh, indicate uh, how you might want to go beyond that. Because the generators for this group, or for this ring, uh, were very well understood. Um, it has two, and it's a very large number. It's two to the n minus one generators, OK? Uh, and they can be, I won't be very specific about what they are, but they can be labeled by columns of uh, integers, tuples of integers, I1, I2, down to IK. Uh, so these are incre strictly increasing sequences of integers, which can go between 1 and n. So it's a large collection of generators. Um, and the larger n, the more you get. Um, and uh, so this is, the, this is how you can label the generators. And the relations also are very well understood. There's a huge number of relations, um, and, but they're all quadratic. They all just involve products of two of the generators. Okay, so you have this ring described in terms of generators and relations, but this didn't make Hodge happy. Uh, because why? Well, when you have a lot of relations, you know, you can form some complicated expression in the generators, and it may be zero. And so you really haven't done anything. But unless, you know, if there are tons and tons of generators and tons and tons of relations, it can be very difficult to tell when some expression is zero or not. So Hodge wanted to take, uh, so well, you know that if you have the generators, uh, you can take all the monomials in these generators, right? You can raise the generators to powers and multiply them together. You can form all the monomials in the generators, and that will certainly span your algebra, but of course in a redundant fashion. There will be some which represent the same different uh, combinations of monomials and generators will represent the same thing, and that's what the relations are telling you. But if there's too many relations, it can be very difficult to tell uh, whether you have two expressions the same or not. So Hodge wanted to find, what he wanted to do was find a collection of monomials in the generators which formed a basis for this ring. So there was no redundancy. A very nice collection of monomials in the generators that would span the algebra in an irredundant way. Um, and this is what he, this is how he, uh, this is the answer he found. Um, so. He, um, he said, well, for each monomial, I will make a tableau. So what did he do? He took, so the, the monomials are these columns of in, strictly increasing integers. So what, you, what I do is I just write these down uh, next to each other, okay? And I can, I can put the longer ones first and the shorter ones lay, later. So I make a nice uh, shape like this. And uh, so down each column, I have strictly increasing sets of 
integers. And so each one of those is a generator. And so I think of this tableau as representing the product of all those generators. So this tableau represents a monomial in the generators. Uh, and Hod said that, the, uh, that I, I'll get a basis if I require that these tableau be what's called semi-standard. And what does that semi-standard mean? It means that uh, the rows should be weakly increasing. So you see the columns are strictly increasing, but the rows should be weakly increasing. So that you can have repetitions along the rows, but they should always go up. Uh, so um, uh, semi-standard uh, tableau parameterizes the monomial, and the, all, all the monomials that you get that way uh, form a basis uh, for this flag algebra. Okay, well that may seem like uh, not very enlightening either, so let, let me put that in slightly different, um, a slightly different perspective on that. So, um, yeah, okay, so here's this Hodge theorem. The standard monomials form a basis for the flag algebra. Okay. Um, so here's a way to think about that that maybe make it seem a little bit more um, helpful. Uh, so the idea is we want to put a partial order on the, ba on the generators. So I take one column of I's and another column of J's and I'll say that this one is less than or equal to that one if just uh, <coughs> sort of row by row this one is bigger. So I1 should be less than or equal to J1, I2 should be less than or equal to J2, I3 less than or equal to J3, all the way along. And if this one is longer, then we don't put any conditions in the last one. So the conditions only last up to the bottom of the right-hand guy. And it, well, the right-hand guy should always be shorter than the left-hand guy. Okay, so this gives us a partial order, which is fairly easy to, um, to check. And uh, then we can translate the semi-standard condition uh, by means of this partial ordering. And we can say that a tableau is semi-standard if and only if its columns are increasing as you go from the left to the right. So a, a semi-standard tableau is an increasing sequence of, uh, of, tableau, of column of the generators for the flag algebra. So uh, since they form a basis, that means that if I take, if I now sort of stand back and I say, well, let me take a uh, collection so if, if, the, if the columns in a tableau are weakly increasing, that means in particular that they form a totally ordered set. Any two elements of that, uh, any two columns in that tableau are comparable to each other. So you have a totally ordered set. And if, if, if those guys form a basis, that means that if I take a totally ordered set of columns and I look at the algebra that they generate, there will be no relations in that algebra. That will be a polynomial ring. Okay, so that for every totally ordered set of columns, I'll get a polynomial subring. And the fact that these form a basis means that if I take, if I look at all the totally ordered sets of columns, and take the polynomial subring that each one of those things generate, then altogether those span the whole flag algebra. So I get a finite number of polynomial subrings of the flag algebra, and all, together they span it. So that, a way of, we can say that is that the flag algebra is an almost direct sum of polynomial subrings. So this is pretty nice. It says that you can find a large collection, or I mean, you can find a finite collection of polynomial subrings which are big in the sense that a finite number of them span it and in a, in a very comprehensible and almost irredundant way. So from that point of view, this is a pretty nice uh, description of the flag algebra. Okay. Uh, so 
again, so Hodge's calculation, uh, which was done, as I said, around 1940, stimulated a huge amount of research. And uh, so for the next about 50 years, people were trying to figure out what was it that Hodge had done? Uh, what, made what, he, what made it work? Um, and this has led to a sort of a new way of thinking about rings um, and how to describe them. So as I said, the old paradigm, which came out of the initial calculations in, in uh, invariant theory, was to understand uh, rings in terms of generators and relations. And uh, the new way is to approximate uh, your given ring by a simpler kind of ring, a semi-group ring. And I want to explain uh, what's involved in that. Uh, before I do that, let me just mention that uh, so uh, uh, geometrically, uh, the, the, uh, the old way of describing a ring amounted to what we call an affine embedding. So the ring corresponded to some variety, and choosing a set of generators gave an embedding of that variety into some vector space. So that's called an affine embedding. The new way of understanding is actually you take that variety and you push it and shove it a little bit until it turns into a, a very symmetric kind of variety called a toric variety. So you deform your variety into a toric variety. So this is called toric deformation. OK, so how does this work? Well, uh, let's look at the polynomial algebra. So, right, the, the generators and relations paradigm for understanding rings is kind of a Procrustean bed because it's, it says there's really only one ring in each dimension that we're going to compare things to. Only the polynomial ring is sort of the gold standard, and we want to understand everything in terms of that. So what is it that's so nice about the polynomial ring? Well, one thing that's nice, of course, is, well, here's what a polynomial is. It's a sum with some coefficients of some monomials in the generating variables. So that means that the monomials in the variables form a basis for the ring. And um, they have th this basis has the very nice property that it is multiplicative, right? So if I, if I take two monomials, and uh, so first of all, I can label the monomial by a set of powers. How much did I raise the first variable to? How much the second variable, and so forth. So I record the powers that the variables are raised to in, in a tuple of in, <coughs> integers like that. And then you get the very nice formula, I mean, uh, law of exponents, that, uh, that if I multiply two monomials together, then the uh, tuple that labels the product is just the sum of the tuples that labels the two factors. So um, what's going on here is uh, that I really have uh, a semigroup algebra. So um, the, um, I have, if I have some semigroup, so this is a thing where you can multiply, so this is some structure where you can multiply things together. I call it multiplication, but it could be addition also. So uh, if, you, if, you have a, a semi, if you have a semigroup, then you can form formal linear combinations of the elements of the semigroup, and you can multiply them together according to the semigroup rule. And this is exactly what's going on with the polynomial ring. Your semigroup is the positive integers uh, to the nth power. So n copies of the positive integers, and you just take a monomial to the, its labeling exponents, and then that makes an identification of the polynomial ring with the semigroup ring on this uh, n copies of, of the of the non-negative integers. And this, so this is a semigroup. It's sort of the simplest uh, semigroup there is. It's a free abelian semigroup 
on n letters that commutes, and there are no relations in it. Uh, just the exponents tell you which element you have. Okay. So uh, if we're going to follow that lead, we'll say, well, what other can we find some other semigroups? And it turns out that there are tons and tons of semigroups that could possibly be used. And what they look like are, this is a large collection. So what you do is you take a cone in some Euclidean space. So you've got Euclidean space, and you take some linear functionals on, on the space, and so that uh, they define a half space, right? So there's a, uh, there's a hyperplane where the functional vanishes, and then there's a half space where it's negative, and a half space where it's positive. So if you have a collection of these guys, you can look at the intersections of all the half spaces where the functions are non-negative. And this will be a, a convex set, meaning that if you have any two points in it, the, the line joining them is in it. And it will be uh, conical in the sense that if I have any element in it and I dilate that element, I stretch it or shrink it, it will still be in it. So you get a convex cone by uh, taking a finite number of linear functionals and intersecting their positive half spaces. And for, so, for example, one, one example is the positive orthon. So you take <coughs> um, the, the, the vectors that are, have a non-negative coordinate for each coordinate, uh, and that, that will be uh, the, the, the positive cone associated just to the coordinate functions. So obviously, there's a huge number of these cones. And then for each such cone, uh, you could take the intersection of that cone with the integer vectors. Okay, So um, I call this a lattice cone. So you've got your cone. You've got the lattice of integer vectors. You look at the intersection. And uh, there's a very general theorem, which in fact more or less goes back to Gordon. This, this theorem was kind of implicitly in Gordon's proof of finite generation uh, back in the 1860s or 70s. And uh, anyway, what it says is that if you take uh, this, uh, the set of integral vectors in this cone, if the uh, functionals which are defining the sides of the cone have rational coefficients, if they're rational vectors, then uh, this, uh, the set of integral points in there will be uh, finitely generated. So I, I, should have, I should have said first, it's a semigroup. If I add two of them together, uh, it will again be in the, in the positive cone. It will again be integral. So this intersection is a semigroup. And if the, co if the sides of the cone are rational, then this is actually a finitely generated semigroup. So then if I look at its associated semigroup ring, that will be a finitely generated ring, which is a, ki a, a kind of ring that the uh, ring theorists like to study. Um, OK. So. Uh, that's, this is the general idea, and uh, so just let me uh, show some pictures which will illustrate that. So here's a lattice, um, and here's a cone. Okay, so this is the idea that... Uh, So you take, uh, so I've got two lines here. So like, think of this part up here as being the positive half space associated to this line. And this down here as being the positive half space associated to this line. Then I get the region in between the two lines as the cone uh, associated to those two lines. And then uh, I've got the integral points inside. Um, and this is a good time to illustrate. So of course, uh, one example of such a thing is I could take just the positive quadrant in this case. In two dimensions, it's the po positive quadrant. And um, 
So that's certainly one example of uh, an, a lattice cone. And so something that's, so what is nice about this, uh, sort of from an abstract point of view, is that um, <clears throat> so if you, if you have a cone, there will be certain extreme lines uh, that uh, are just barely in the cone. And so in the case of the positive orthon, it's the x-axis and the y-axis. And uh, so those lines will have some integral points in them. And if I took all the sums of the integral points in those lines, I would get some semigroup, OK? And it will be contained inside the set of all integral points inside here. And in the case of the, the quadrant, in fact, I get every point, right? So here are the two smallest integral points in the extreme lines. And I, if I take any point inside, uh, I see that this point here is the sum of three times this one and two times this one. So uh, if I take the semigroup generated by the integral points on the extreme lines, I get the whole thing. So we can say that the positive orthon is integrally simplicial. So simplicial means, first of all, that the cross-section is a simplex. That's the simplest possible polyhedron. And then uh, it's integrally simplicial in the sense that these extreme rays generate the whole thing. The, um, the, the guy that I showed you first, this one here, um, is again, um, it's a simplicial cone. Well, every cone in two dimensions is simplicial. There are two dimensions. Uh, they're hardly, <clears throat> they all look the same. They're just a slice of pie. But from an integral point of view, they look different, okay? So here, uh, it's always tricky to do this. Uh, um, yeah, it's always, you have to be careful about this. So here, uh, so here's the integral points on this line, and here are the integral points on this one. And you see, so I've, I've, I've drawn the lattice in here of the things that are the sums of the guys on the extreme rays, and you see it misses some. These two guys in here are not sums of things on the ex extreme rays. So this cone is not integrally simplicial. Okay, so um, <clears throat> uh, so that's that's here's a, a source of a huge number of algebras, which are sort of in a in a rough sense, in the sense of having this nice basis, which is multiplicative, uh, are are generalized the uh, the po the polynomial ring, and they're called. Uh, the, the varieties associated with these rings are called affine toric varieties. And uh, th these three families of things are essentially the same. They're, they're th the same thing in different guises. So affine toric varieties, this is the geometric uh, aspect of them, a totally graded algebra. So you can find some, in other words, uh, there is, <clears throat> you can find a grading on this algebra such that every subspace is, is just one dimensional, so corresponding to the elements of the semigroup. And then on the other hand, uh, the, the semigroup ring of a, uh, of, a, of a semigroup, which is, well, I, I want to say a lattice cone, but in fact, if you wanted to, uh, you know, if you want to be a little bit perverse, you can throw away a finite number of points. Um, this makes it a little bit more complicated. So the, the lattice cone ones are sort of the nicest guys, and you can make things more singular by throwing away some finite numbers of points. Uh, but that, uh, I'll more or less ignore that aspect of things. Okay. So then the idea would be that. Uh, 
uh, okay, you've got some general ring that you uh, was handed to you somehow, and you'd like to describe it in terms of one of these semigroup rings. So, are there any techniques for approximating or, or finding a semigroup ring which looks like some general ring that you met on the street? And it turns out, so in the last, uh, in, by, in, the, in the development of computational <coughs> uh, commutative algebra, there's been developed a theory which does this. It's called SAGB theory, and SAGB stands for subalgebra analog of Grubner basis ideals for ideals theory. So some of you may have heard of Grubner bases. So this was has been a big uh, development, a big idea in in allowing. Uh, commutative algebra computation is to be done by computer. And um, so the fundamental, the basic ingredient in, in defining Grubner bases is what's called a term order. So here <coughs> we're looking at mon monomials, the, the usual semigroup of uh, the positive orthant. Um, and you put, what you do is you put a total ordering on the monomials. And uh, it should satisfy a couple properties. I haven't listed them all here, but the key ones that I want to talk about are, first of all, zero is the minimum. And then uh, if uh, it's compatible with multiplication in the sense that if L is less than or equal to L prime and I add some fixed vector to both of them, then still L plus M is less than or equal to L prime plus M prime. Uh, <clears throat> so, and there are many, many ways to define these total orderings. Uh, one way is to just, you take some linear functional which is very irrational, and uh, then a linear function will map the positive integers to the real line, and if it's a very irrational functional, no two integral points will go to the same point. And then so you've got all your monomials sort of inside the real line, and you just line them up according to the total ordering on the real line. So that's one way to do it. Uh, and there, you can combine that with some other constructions. Another important way of doing it is just what's called lexicographic order. So you look at the power of the first of x1, and then you look at the power of x2, and so forth, and you order them as if it was an alphabet. Uh, so if uh, two things have the have x1 to a the one with x1 to the larger power is bigger, and if it's tied, then you go to x2, and so forth like that. So there's lots and lots of ways to construct these uh, total orderings, and that flexibility is an important part of their usefulness. Uh, okay, but uh, so a key thing is then that if we have a polynomial. We it will be a sum of mono, a linear combination of monomials, and we can uh, look at those and we can say which one is the biggest. And then that's called the leading monomial. And the key property, because of the way this, the properties of this total order, is that if I take two po polynomials and take their product, then the leading monomial of the product is just the product of the leading monomials. Or in the semigroup, it's the sum of the. Uh, okay, so um, then, <clears throat> so uh, then, if you have some algebra inside the polynomial ring, uh, and you have a term order on monomials, then you can define uh, a semigroup associated to that, the semigroup of leading exponents. So you look at all the elements in the algebra, you find the leading monomial for each one, uh, and that, so that will be some monomial, some element of z plus to the n, and uh, the multiplication property implies that that's a semigroup. So if I multiply uh, two monomials together, each one is the leading exponent of something, and so the sum is the uh, leading exponent of the product. So this guy is a semigroup. Uh, the set of leading exponents of things in the algebra is a semigroup. And you call then some subset of the algebra a SAGB basis 
if the leading monomials uh, of, the, of that set generate the semigroup. Uh, okay. Well, so it turns out that, um, so then the semigroup will be finitely generated if there's a finite SAG B basis. And uh, it turns out that SAG B bases do not always exist. So you can find, there, there are examples of finitely generated subrings of polynomials uh, such that the, and, and term orders such that the uh, leading terms are, uh, the semigroup of leading terms is actually infinitely generated. Uh, so this means, uh, so what, that's, uh, could be discouraging, but uh, the optimistic way of looking at that is that means when, uh, when they are finitely generated, then it's interesting. Uh, and you can then, uh, uh, again, general theories uh, shows that if you have a finite SAG B basis, then uh, the semigroup associated to your algebra is actually a finite index in a lattice cone. So it is uh, a semigroup of the type we were talking about. And um, so you can then ask, well, is this uh, semigroup ring uh, some, uh, some, does it reflect uh, some of the properties of the original ring? Uh, and the answer is yes, and there's a general theorem uh, due to Concha and Herzog and Valla, which says that if uh, the associated semigroup ring is finitely generated, uh, then uh, the semigroup ring is what's known as a flat deformation of, uh, or the, the ring itself is a flat deformation of the semigroup ring. Okay, so that, uh, as a layperson, I just interpret this to mean looks a lot like. So, um, so here you have a, a semigroup algebra, and it looks a lot like your original algebra. And of course, then the, the semigroup, uh, the variety associated to that semigroup is a toric variety, so you have deformed, uh, you can actually construct a continuous family of algebras depending on a parameter t, such that for all non-zero values of t, it's this algebra. And then for t equals zero, it's this. So uh, deformation in that sense, that there's a continuous family that connects the two. OK. Um, <clears throat> so. Um, Okay, so what does this have to do with uh, earlier things? So um, in 1996, Gonchalea and Lakshmibai showed that in fact, <coughs> Hodge's um, theory of standard monomials, what it was, was essentially constructing a toric deformation of the flag algebra of GLN. Uh, and uh, this was followed up by the work of several, by in several more papers over the next few years, uh, which showed that uh, um, that the the similar results for for general groups. So Caldero showed that the flag algebra for any reductive group was uh, had a toric deformation, and then uh, Alexeyev and Brion showed uh, that a slightly more general family of, of varieties also had toric deformations. And um, uh, so these, uh, <clears throat> these papers use various techniques, but I, I've indicated to you that, um, that term orders are, are, are an important tool for doing this. And this was actually done in a slightly less general case than considered by Gonchalet and Laxmi Bai by Sturmfels at about the same time. Uh, he showed that uh, the coordinate ring of Grassmannians uh, had, um, had a toric deformation using term orders. And then he generalized this with a student of his to the full uh, flag algebra for GLN. And uh, this was also done by 
my student uh, Sang Jib Kim in his thesis. Uh, <coughs> actually, Sang Jib is in the front row here today. Um, uh, and then uh, with uh, a various young people, uh, I've shown uh, that uh, the, another class of algebras, the branching algebras, for a large collection of classical uh, symmetric pairs, uh, classical groups and, and symmetric subgroups, uh, also have flat deformation to lattice cone semigroup rings. And um, I think this theorem is interesting in that for the flag algebras, as I said, uh, the generators and relations were known. They had been known for a long time <coughs> uh, for GLN, and then uh, Costin showed in general how you could describe generators and relations for the flag algebra for any reductive group. But these branching algebras actually are not understood as algebras. There are no descriptions of generators and relations for these algebras. Nevertheless, we can give toric deformations of them. We can, we can find uh, semigroup rings which look very similar to them. So in some sense, uh, this toric, uh, there is no generators and relations alternative to this toric description of these branching algebras. Okay, um, so how am I doing here? Oh, it was already gone over. Um, well, uh, so I, I want to say one, one further thing, which is that um, in some sense, uh, maybe, you know, maybe we went a little bit too far in, in allowing arbitrary lattice cones because there are really a lot of them. Right? Uh, classification things are, there's always a tension between having a reasonable collection of things that, that you can, that you can uh, describe, that you can use to describe general things and being able to describe the things that you're using, right? So there's all, if you, if you use more things, you have more work to describe them. And unfortunately, there are lots and lots of lattice cones. And, uh, um, so let me, let me show you uh, what I mean by that. Maybe there, I mean, maybe lattice cones themselves are pretty hard to understand because, okay, so as I said before, um, even though in, in two dimensions every cone is simplicial, but maybe not integrally simplicial. So uh, there's, there's some uh, points in here which are not sums of the points on the boundaries. <clears throat> so the first invariant of, uh, of a lattice cone in two dimensions is that relative volume. What is the index of the semigroup generated by the, by the boundary uh, lines in, in, in the whole lattice? And then once you have that index, uh, there's another invariant, which I'll try to illustrate here. Okay, so I'm going to take uh, cones uh, that have relative index 5, okay? So I can, always, I can always put one generator to be the standard unit vector on the x-axis, and then the other generator will be something on a line that's 5 above, but it should not be on, uh, on a line that has shorter things. So the thing on the thing 5 above should be the first integral point, okay? So, I mean, so here is one. Uh, <clears throat> and um, so here the generators are this and this, and then these guys in the middle are not, uh, not integral combinations of them, so you have to throw them in to be generators for the semigroup. Or you could take uh, this one. So you could take, again, so this guy and this guy, and then you need these four guys. Or you could take uh, 
you could take this one and this one, and then you need these four guys inside this uh, red parallelogram, or you could take uh, the last one is this one over here. Okay. So in each case, uh, the index uh, is 5. But these algebras look, I mean, in some sense, these algebras look, I mean, in some sense, they're almost the same, right? Uh, they're all <coughs> index 5 lattices uh, inside the positive orthon. But uh, from a ring theoretic point of view, from a generators and relations point of view, they look quite different. Uh, this first ring here has six generators and ten relations. Uh, the second ring has four generators and three relations, and the third ring the same. And the fourth ring has only three generators and one relation. So, uh, so these things which look almost the same from the point of view of generators and relations are kind of a mess. Uh, so uh, this, this leads, uh, might, might give you some doubt about uh, the ultimate useful, usefulness of just knowing that something had a toric deformation. Then, you, then, you, then your job is to say something, well, what does the, the semigroup look like? Um, <clears throat> and it turns out that uh, there is a very nice class of semigroups which uh, which I'm going to go through this kind of very fast. But so you take a partially ordered set, and you look at the vector space of all real valued functions on that, and then the the, the cone of order preserving functions on that, and the cone of non negative order preserving functions on that, and each one of those has. Uh, integral points inside it in a natural way. So this last guy here, I'll call it z plus x greater than or equal to the, the cone of non-negative integral valued order preserving functions on a partially ordered set. And that's, that's a natural lattice cone. And uh, turns out that you can give two very nice descriptions of this. You can explicitly describe the generators and relations. And also, uh, you can find a, it has an abstract standard monomial theory. So you can find a, uh, a finite number of polynomial subrings such that the whole ring is, uh, is uh, almost direct sum of those polynomial subrings. Well, what those polynomial subrings are is that you can find a decomposition of the whole cone into integrally simplicial subcones, uh, such that the whole cone is the union of those, and then the, the semigroup ring is the, is the almost direct sum of the polynomial rings associated with those subcones. And, um, and the, the subcones are a very nice, well behaved set of subcones, very naturally defined in terms of the orders. I don't think I have time to go into that uh, in a lot of detail. But let me, um, let me give you the simplest possible example of that, which is this one here, non-trivial example. So here's a partially ordered set uh, with three elements, A, B, and C. Uh, and it turns out that the, the generators correspond to the characteristic functions of increasing subsets. So here you have a, A, B, A, C, and the whole set. So there are four generators. <clears throat> the polynomial subrings correspond, as in the Hodge case, to the maximal chain. So you have A contained in A, B, contained in A, B, C, and likewise A contained in A, C, contained in A, B, C. So there's two polynomial subrings, and there's exactly one relation, uh, which is that uh, the characteristic function of this times the characteristic function of the whole thing is equal to the characteristic function of that plus the characteristic function of that. And the, uh, so the picture of this cone 
I hope this is intelligible. So here's uh, three-dimensional space. The axes are the are the points of the are the directions of the uh, three elements of this of the uh, post set, and then these guys here are the diagonal lines in the in the three planes, and then this is the this is the central line of the positive orthon where all three coordinates are equal, and then the semi group the cone is a, so is contained these two uh, sub cones, okay. Of consisting of which are spanned by A, B, C, A, C, and C, A, and A, B, C, A, B, and C. So you've got those <coughs> two, um, you've got this <coughs> whole cone divided into these two uh, simplicial, integrally simplicial subcones. And in fact, that example came up in 19th century algebraic geometry. It's the coordinate ring of the Segre embedding of uh, P1 cross P1 in, uh, in four space. Uh, so let me just, uh, you can, so the thing about these things is all, there are only a finite number of posets of any given size, so there's only a finite number of these guys in any dimension. So they're very special in contrast to the huge numbers of uh, lattice cones in general that there are. So then you can go through and you can compute very nicely what the invariants are. So here are four. This is all the Po sets of size up to four. And uh, so the generators of, of those, uh, of, their, of their rings are, are, are given by these numbers. Uh, so you can compute those very nicely. And these, actually, these examples here the sort of the totally unordered sets uh, are, are, are very stupid ones. Uh, this, these are actually polynomial rings, but uh, these generators correspond to every, every product of uh, generators of exponent one, so that, and there's a huge number of relations saying you don't really need the larger products. So it's the, 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 these guys here are sort of very stupid presentations of the polynomial rings, but other ones are, are of course, non-trivial. Uh, and then um, there is uh, the number of uh, polynomial subrings that you need to uh, express these guys also varies uh, from one. So for the total ordering, you always only have one, and you have then varying numbers up to n factorial uh, for the uh, for the heap. Okay, so these uh, form a very, very nice and very special class of uh, of lattice cones. And so the summary then of the development since 1940, when Hodge did his original uh, work, and it was had many, many contributors. And I can't guarantee that uh, this is all of them, but. Uh, Laxmi, Bai, and Gonchalea were a, a critical uh, step. And uh, to the best of my knowledge, this version of the theorem first explicitly occurred in the, in the thesis of, of Sungjib Kim. And uh, so it says that the, the, uh, the coordinate ring of the flag manifold of GLN is, well, I should have a little plus there. I won't say what that means. Uh, so is a flat deformation of <clears throat> of the uh, semigroup ring associated to a certain post set called the Gelfand Setlin post set, which looks like this. It's a triangular array of points that actually can be embedded in uh, the positive quadrant in, in Z2. It's called the Gelfand Setlin post set. And um, so there's one, this is the one for four. It has four things along the sides. Um, and so anyway, so this is what Hodge did. He essentially showed that uh, the coordinate ring, the flag manifold of GLN, was a flat deformation, or this is how we can understand it now, was a flat deformation of a certain uh, semigroup ring. And uh, these, these, I should say, these semigroup rings were first defined actually by uh, Takayuki Hibi, so we call them Hibi rings. And uh, 
Well, if this was the only example of a Hibbe ring in invariant theory, then this wouldn't be too interesting. But it turns out that there are many, many other situations that you can understand with Hibbe rings. So um, <clears throat> this then, uh, it seems that uh, this, this approximating rings by, uh, by semigroup rings provides uh, a new sort of more powerful approach to understanding a lot of rings in invariant theory. Thank you for listening. Okay, uh, I want to thank Roger for his uh, wonderful talk. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, oh, here, okay. Um, I'd like to, uh, Roger is here. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Okay. I like to know, okay, it's, uh, what's the real meaning okay, behind okay, this? You said there's a flat deformation of the torical, uh, torical variety as the algebra of a uh, uh, coordinated ring of the flag uh, variety. So, what does it really mean, okay, this uh, final result? Okay. Um, I think. I that still try to understand that you have the a parameter, okay, from you sort of, you, when t equal to zero is yeah. the coordinate ring, yeah. t equal to one is the, the, the deformation part, right? Yeah. And the one in between, what's, what's the really mean this? Okay, the, well, I, I, I think of it as, um, I mean, I think other people have more geometric insight into that this than I do, but I think of it in terms of, um, I mean, if you think of it in terms of the semigroup, right, you're looking at the leading terms. You're le looking at the leading terms of these polynomials. So what you're sort of doing is you're shrinking down all, uh, all the, the lower terms to zero. So it's like the, the relations are, are simplifying. You're just throwing away almost all the relations except the ones between the leading terms. So this is uh, how I think of it, is, is you're looking at a, a, a simplified algebra with simplified, it's sort of the same elements, but the relations between them have been reduced to just what happens when you multiply highest terms together. Only the highest terms of the relations uh, survive. So that's, uh, that's how I, I, that's sort of a very kind of superficial and algebraic way of looking at it, and I'm sure that there are more geometric ways of looking at it, but I can't tell you that. Um, the, uh, I think it's a, actually, I think it's a rather subtle problem because there's nothing, I mean, canonical about this at the moment. There's, I, there's no uh, way of, of characterizing what are all the possible things that you might get. You can get very different uh, kinds of uh, toric deformations. I mean, in fact, it's possible to take um, a polynomial ring. In fact, this is an important example in invariant theory. You can take up the, N, the polynomials on the n by m matrices, and you can deform them so it, they look like the uh, the semigroup ring of a very complicated. Uh, well, it's a, again, it's a it's a poset ring. So, it, but of a rather complicated poset. Uh, so. Uh, so this is not, uh, in some sense, you, is, there's some, uh, you're, you're exercising some discretion in, in, in doing this deformation. And, and the, uh, the result is sort of not preordained. There's not some uniqueness theorem here. All you can say is that I can find a useful deformation. At the moment, that's, I think that's the best uh, we can say. Uh, I hope that eventually well, this will be another round of inspiration to say exactly what, what this means and what are the different possible uh, deformations. But at the moment, it's still in the, we're in the excited phase of, oh, we can, we can actually understand some algebras this way. I think there was a question. Can you pass the mic? Uh, I don't know it, I'm afraid. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, was my question clear? Yeah, but I, uh, I, I'm for, 
unfortunately, I don't know that algebra well enough to comment. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah. Other questions? Is there any room to add a skill variable to the picture? Whatever that means. Uh, Adding skill variable to the picture. Uh, oh, uh, I don't know. Um, probably it would be possible, but I, I, I don't know motivating examples. So the examples that we're trying to understand are all just uh, you know standard commutative rings. Uh, they're the uh, they're the coordinate rings on some. Uh, but I mean, yeah, you know, if you wanted to do cohomology or something like that, you might want to deform uh, a super algebra. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, certainly there would be room for considering things like that, but uh, I don't know of an example where it's been done. Other questions? Some other questions. Can I ask you one more question? Uh, since from the Toric viewpoint of view, and uh, you have the deformation, the, the coordinated ring. Now you're given okay, the, um, the uh, torque variety, okay. And whether you can find some okay algebra corresponding, okay, who, who, which is the deformation of some other discover, okay, some other uh, algebra or representation, okay, theory would be help. Um, Isn't there many okay, the torque variety, okay? Yeah. Well, I should have mentioned that actually any. Any one of these, uh, um, if you study invariant theory, then any one of these uh, lattice cones, uh, the, the semigroup ring of any, any, any lattice cone, uh, can be the invariance of some action of a diagonal subgroup on the polynomials. So, so if you want to understand invariant theory, you automatically have, in some sense, have to understand all of these algebras. So you're not really introducing anything new uh, in, in, in looking at these. In some sense, you're saying, can I understand other situations where the group is not just a diagonal subgroup in terms of these same algebras? So you've already got these already. You're, you're stuck with them. And you're saying, can I use them for other things? Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Okay. <laughs> ah, non commute Well, um, whoa. Uh, I think that, I, I'm, well, I would bet that there are some interesting non-commutative deformations. But I, I, again, I can't give you an example now. Um, well, in particular, uh, they have a notion uh, of, a, of a Kazool algebra, which is, uh, which is an algebra with quadratic relations and satisfying some extra conditions, which I, I couldn't recite for you. Um, and. Uh, so there probably is, in, 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 the, in, the, in the context of Kazool algebras, an in, interesting deformation theory. Uh, but again, so I, I don't have examples. OK, uh, any other questions? I, I'll, I'll mention that uh, in developing algebras, the, the usual standard thing is to do the graded algebra, which, of course, are symmetric. Yeah. But so this is related, I guess, to yeah. what you were mentioning. Yeah. I should say also, well, I mean, you know, there's, there's deformations. These deformations make things simpler, right? We're, we're, we're uh, in, in this situation, you know, all the, the generic point, the algebra, is always your original algebra. And then at one point, it's the, uh, the semigroup ring which is simpler than the generic point. But uh, another kind of deformation that's been very important in <coughs> representation there is 
is the quantum group, in which, uh, which the quantum groups are more complicated than the, the quantum groups are, are deformations of, Lie, uh, of the enveloping algebra of Lie algebra, and they're more complicated than the, the enveloping algebra. So this is another way that deformation theory has been used, but in kind of a totally different uh, direction. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, then uh, let's thank Roger for a wonderful talk.